Welcome, Betsy. We're, we're honored to have you here. Um, it is our great pleasure to have Hall of Fame work out for Betsy Rose here with us today. Before I ask her to come forward and accept our honorary membership in the Delaware Women's Golf Association, I wanted to highlight a few of her many accomplishments. Um, in 1951, Betsy started playing at the age of 17 and joined the LPGA just six years later. In her 24 years on tour, she won 55 tournaments, including eight major championships, four of them being U.S. Opens. In 1959, she won the LPGA Bear Trophy for the lowest scoring average. Betsy retired from playing the tour in 1975, but she was not done with her LPGA. She continued to contribute and grow the tour by serving as the tournament director for six years. The work done during her tenor helped develop the tour into the one we all enjoy today. In 1981, Betsy continued her service as the executive director of the LPGA's McDonald's Championship. This championship was dear to many of us since it was played at the McDonald's, I'm sorry, at the DuPont Country Club. In 1997, when the USGA bestowed their highest award, the Bobby Jones Award, for distinguished sportsmanship to Betsy, there is no doubt that it was for her character both on and off the course. She was born in South Carolina, grew up in Texas, and now calls Delaware her home. She was inducted into the Delaware Women's Hall of Fame in 2006. And now we proudly say, in 2013, Betsy Rawls is our first honorary member of the Delaware Women's Golf Association. Well, thank you for being with us today, Betsy. It's a real treat for all of us. You had a long and storied Hall of Fame career. But your start to the game was, I think, most amazing. Just four years after taking up the game of golf, you won the Texas Amateur. I need to know, was the game that easy for you, or did you just <laughs> practice a whole lot? Well, easy is it's not an adjective we can ever use about golf. I agree. Yeah, so, <laughs> so it didn't come easy. Uh, I don't know why I was successful in the beginning. One reason that. Uh, I was in the University of Texas, and I studied a lot, and I think I could focus well, to tell you the truth, because uh, that's a big part of playing golf well, being able to concentrate on what you're doing, and so I think that helped a lot, and uh, I had no expectations for another thing. I, nobody expected me to win a Texas, a Texas championship, and uh, so I had no pressure, and I just, you know, I enjoyed the golf, and played, happened to play well that week, and so started off winning a tournament. Well, you're obviously a gifted um, athlete. Did you play any other sports before golf? Well, you know, I, yes, but the, the kids' games, there were no organized sports much for junior am, juniors when I was growing up. See, I was, I was born in 1928, so, and that, the, so I'm 85, just you don't want to be your own man. <laughs> In 1929, the Great Depression hit, and then uh, I grew up in that nobody played golf much, and everybody was worried about you know, feeding, feeding family and having jobs and all that. Uh, and my dad, we were very fortunate, we did okay through that, but there was no golf. And then World War II came along, uh, so uh, what was the question? <laughs> oh, I played any other sports. Oh, I played the other sports. So I played all those, the, uh, there were no organized sports is what I was trying to say. Even in, in the University of Texas, they didn't have a women's golf team there. The Southwest Conference had no uh, intercollegiate sports for women at that time, which seemed like the, you know, the dark ages. But uh, I played all the games the kids played. And they had a tennis court in their backyard, and I played softball and all that. But uh, uh, there were no, no team sports. Who or what drew you to the game of golf? My dad played uh, when he was young. He uh, won the Indianapolis City Championship, in fact, when he was in high school. And then uh, he got married and had a family and all that. He quit playing, and then one day when I was 17, he said, I'm going to 
to go out and, and take up golf again, would you like to come with me? And of course I jumped at that and we went out and I was hooked immediately and kept playing it ever after that well, because of my father's influence. Great. Um, Harvey Pennick was your only instructor. In his little blue book, For All Who Love the Game, Lessons and Te Teachings for Women, you said that Pennick knew where to start with women. He knew what they did naturally and what movements they had to be taught. Can you elaborate on what movements are difficult for women? Well, Harvey was a very wise man. and He read people beautifully. And if a woman came for a lesson, then he could tell if she had played sports before. If she had, for instance, been used to swinging a baseball bat or playing tennis or doing that. And if those movements did not come naturally, as they did to some women, then he had to teach those to her. And uh, he had various techniques for te teaching how to swing a golf club. Um, I remember, funny, that uh, Marilena Falk, who was a uh, player on the LPGA Tour in those early days, went with me one day, one time to Texas, to Austin. And uh, she was taking a lesson from Harvey. And she had a problem getting the bottom of the swing at the ball. She would tend to hit behind the ball. And Harvey would say, well, I'll stand up, and address it here, position the ball, and she would hit behind it. And Harvey said, you know, and he said, just don't concentrate on hitting that spot in front of the ball. And she couldn't do it. And he said, if that was a snake, you'd have hit it. <laughs> <laughs> That's the way of talking. It, it gave people uh, impressions of, of uh, uh, mental images of what they should be doing. Uh, but he, uh, it's simply because some women were harder to teach because they had not had experience playing sports. Um, while the 13 founders started the LPGA, you stayed at the University of Texas and graduated Phi Beta Kappa. As a student, a student of physics and mathematics, what career do you think you would have had if the LPGA had not formed? <laughs> well, uh, you know, I, I don't know. I, I, I was never one to make definite plans about my future. I was always an optimist, and I thought, well, something good's going to turn up. But uh, <laughs> I did it ever. I wanted to play golf as an amateur uh, for a little while before, I, after I got out of school. And I was playing in the uh, in a Florida circuit. You know, they had a lot of women, a, a series of women's amateur tournaments there. And I went down and played. And the last one was at uh, the title holders at the Augusta Country Club. And uh, so uh, before that week was over, the um, the man who was head of professional golf at Wilson Sporting Goods Company uh, approached me and said, would you be interested in turning pro and coming and joining the Wilson staff? And it took me completely by surprise because uh, the, the LPGA had existed only for, for one year. And uh, they had, uh, Wilson had Babes and Harris on the staff and Patty Burke, and they wanted to add to the staff. And why he picked me, I don't know. But I went home that night, I called my mother and said, Mother, I have a chance to turn pro and go to work for Wilson. And what do you think? She said, well, anything you want to do is OK with me. Now, this is, I've gone through four years of college, majored in physics, and here I was saying, I want to play golf. <laughs> <laughs> so, anyway, that was fine, so I jumped in. Golf was, a, I was addicted to golf. And the, oh yeah, from the very beginning, I was. And I, Think of nothing better than that rather do than play golf. So that's how I happened to turn pro. And I don't know what I would have done. I, I, I didn't know. I forgot all about physics. I think finally I used physics a little bit and tried to learn how to do golf, but I'm not even sure about that. <laughs> um, your first year as a professional, you won the very first tournament you played, the Sacramento Women's Invitational Open. Were you surprised? <laughs> Well, that was so long ago. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I was a little bit surprised, but not terribly. I, somehow I had, I came up with a, uh, an inner feeling of self-confidence. Not that I you know, thought I was a great golfer or anything, but I just had a feeling that I could do almost anything I wanted to do because I always had been able to do that. So I was, I was delighted, of course, and a little surprised, but not, not overwhelmed by it, really. And so it was so early in my career. And therefore, again, I did not expect anything, and I think that was a big thing. In that same year, your first year, you won your first major, a U.S. Women's Open, beating second place finisher Louise Suggs by five strokes. It was the first of eight majors that you would win in your career. 
which of those major wins were most satisfying to you and why? Uh, the last major that I won was by far, it was the LPGA Championship, and it was played in Kayamisha Lake, New York, on a, at the Concord Golf Course. One of the hardest scores I think we ever played a tournament on. And for some reason, I was swinging the, the, the ball, I was swinging the club well that week. But uh, uh, at that point in my career, now, it was, I was supposed to retire, and I knew I wasn't, had not been playing as well. And, I, and that, <clears throat> so it, it, I mean, it was in my mind that I might never be able to win another tournament, or miss, much less a major. And uh, so when I, everything worked out for me that week, I played well, hit the ball well, and I, then I, I mean, that, that uh, pleased me, delighted me, that I was able to win one more major championship when I had no expectation of doing it. I just thought it, perhaps my career was over, and all of a sudden it wasn't. It's 1969. Yeah. Um, only five men have more major wins than you. Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Walter Hagen, Ben Hogan, and Gary Player. Of them, who did you admire most? I um, admired Ben Hogan the most. I played with him, I played with him three or four times, and uh, was so impressed with the way he hit the ball, and as a man, I liked him a lot. He was a very nice man. Uh, and and when I ever watched him after that in exhibitions or tournaments, it was a different sound when he hit the ball. He hit the ball better, I think, than any, anybody that ever lived, and a lot of people say that. So I admired him, and, I, and then if, if, uh, he came back from that awful accident. Uh, he was almost pronounced dead at the scene of that accident. And uh, he survived that, and his legs were, were never the same after that, and he worked and worked and got back to being at the top of his game and won majors after that. Uh, it's funny, I happened to be in the, it this accident happened in West Texas. He was on the way home. And um, I happened to be in Fort Worth right after that. And they had the car that was that he was driving in, during that, in that accident, when that accident happened. And I, I, I would have bet $1,000 no car. It was wow. absolutely a total wreck. And fortunately, his wife Valerie was not badly injured, but he was, uh, I mean, he was critically injured. And, uh, but anyway, he, he was been my hero ever since. There are also only five women with more major wins. Four of them were women that you played with and against. Patty Berg, Mickey Wright, Louise Suggs, and Babe Zaharis. Of those players, who do you think had the purest swing and who was the fiercest competitor? Oh, Mickey Wright, but uh, I had the best swing with anybody I've ever seen, man or woman. And it's funny, Ben Hogan said that too. He said the best golf swing he ever saw was Mickey Wright. But uh, she was, uh, it was a, a, almost well, it was a perfect golf swing. She hit the ball unlike any other woman at the time. She hit it long, moved the club head fast, but hit it high. And uh, she could hit a high two iron to a well trapped green. And who, who could hit two iron? I forgot to say. She could have hit it high, stop it. She was an amazing, amazing player. Uh, she was, uh, grew up in uh, California, like uh, he did. And, uh, I went to Stanford, I think, for two years and came out on tour. And when she came out, uh, she was still had, she had a perfect swing, really good swing. And by the way, let me tell you how she started. She went to, her dad took her to a pro in San Diego Country Club. And uh, her first lesson had been gone. And he had her out there and, he, and then he walked over to a tree and cut off a, a limb and stripped it down and handed that to Mickey. And uh, he said, now let me see you make that, swing that and make it whistle. And this, that was Mickey's first golf lesson. She had to make the, the limb of the, the tree whistle. And then 82 victories later, <laughs> she retired uh, fairly early in the game. But that, I thought that was an interesting beginning. And, uh, she, and anyway, she, uh, she was the best player we ever had, I think. Uh, Kathy Whitworth has won more tournaments, 88. And Kathy's a remarkable player. Uh, she stayed on tour much longer than Mickey did. but. But Mickey was quite a phenomenon on tour. Um, anyway, she got and the most competitive. Well, that had to be Babe Zaharis. Yeah. Babe was, uh, she lived to beat somebody at some game. <laughs> 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 so with, uh, of course, she won three medals in the uh, 1932 Olympics. And, uh, she played other sports. A, a, re a truly remarkable athlete, Babe was. 
and you expect, of course, is the athlete of the century at the, when, 2000. And I've heard, seen several columns from sports writers say that she should have been chosen athlete, not just best woman athlete, but best athlete ever for, for, the, that, for that century. But anyway, she, uh, she loved to win, and uh, she's very competitive, competitive and, but she's the worst loser I ever saw. I've played Jen Romney with her one time. She was losing. She got off through the car cards out the window. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> she was very competitive. Uh, but she's such a great athlete. She died way too young. In recent years, only Annika Sorenstam has more majors. And that was in 2006. She won her last one. Do you see anyone in the LPGA today who is likely to do as well? Boy, there's a lot of good players out there. I don't, I, I'd say no. I, I can't see that happening uh, because there is so much uh, competition now, uh, and so many skillful players from all over the world. And if I had to pick one person to to do that, I, I, I don't know. Maybe Vivian Coleman can do this. She's starting. I mean, God, she turns 17, I think, next month, and she's got a good start. Maybe she can do it, but. Uh, I don't, it has to be absolutely the right combination of, of uh, to win a lot of tournaments. <laughs> not that I'm bragging, I, but uh, it, uh, it has to be, you have to be mentally strong, you have to have great emotional control, uh, you have to have tremendous drive, and uh, a lot of self-confidence, a lot of things like that, and that combination does not come along too often. Uh, so no, I would say no. I, I couldn't pick out anybody that I think is really going to do that. You were the leading money winner in 1952 with $14,505. <laughs> that's, that's about $126,000 in today's dollars. Not too shabby. But thanks to you and your contemporaries, the 2013 leading money winner earned about 2.5 million. <laughs> Women on today's play, LPGA play for a lot more prize money than you did in your day, but do you think they're having as much fun? Yeah. <laughs> um, no, I don't think so. Yeah. Uh, well, I'll say that playing golf for a living in any era is the best way in the world to make a living. Uh, but players, I think, have more stress today, and they, uh, they have more exposure, they, they're, and they are more concerned, or they are concerned about what the sponsors are going to Think or what the, the what's going to come out in the paper? How they're going to look on television? Uh, a lot of uh, the, the exposure in itself brings uh, anxiety, I think, and they have a little more pressure on them now. And we didn't have that. We didn't have that. We we knew that if we played badly, you know, it'd be in the paper probably across the country. But that's about all. We didn't have to worry about how to, how we looked on television, for instance. And, uh, how our sponsors uh, reacted to it because we didn't have any, you know. But, um, so I think they don't, probably don't, don't have as much fun. Uh, we, it, was, it was golf was really always fun for me. I, I I never woke up and said, you know, boy, do I have to go to the golf course today? <laughs> I I couldn't wait. It, it just for practice rounds, I look forward to doing that. So I thoroughly enjoy it, and I never regretted turning pro. And I, uh, but. I, I don't know. The, the things were, were hard. The, I mean, we had to drive. We drove everywhere for the first 10 years of my career. But that was kind of fun in itself. We'd get in the car, drive to the next place, and uh, by the time you got there, you'd forgotten all about those three putts that you just made <laughs> previous week and started all over again. Uh, so there was nothing about it that I really did not enjoy. But, and now it, it's travel is harder, I think. And, but you have to be responsible for two more people and that stuff. Uh, that has stress, and so I think they don't quite have as much fun. But you had distractions in your day too. Um, I read that you conducted up to 120 golf clinics a year, traveling uh, around uh, for Wilson, for Wilson yeah. and you also helped run the tournaments. How were you able to uh, switch that focus switch on when you needed to? Uh, Wilson, <coughs> Wilson had uh, was a leading money club manufacturer back in that era, and uh, they had branches all over. The country, and they would send me to a branch who would schedule clinics, and that was a, 
their, one of their primary ways of advertising. And they, that's what Patty Burke had done for them for years, and Patty was great at it. Uh, and uh, they sent me out with uh, Patty for the first six months to uh, teach her, to hack her, teach me how to do things. And I'm the farthest thing from Patty Burke that uh, you can imagine. She's a real showman, and she, you know, she, she lived to do that, get in front of an audience and say, but, but I created my clinics of my own. And to answer the question about the 120, that, that was very tiring. I don't know how, they didn't have quite as many tournaments, but they took that trick. They actually kept me out of the tournaments once in a while to do, do the clinic work. Uh, but it was really hard for me to do the first few times I did it. I mean, that was, it was totally against my nature to get up there and uh, perform. Uh, but that, it got for easier and easier, and I thought, I think I did it pretty well. But, uh, and then working for the LPGA, the, back in the early years, uh, the, uh, the LPGA players themselves did a lot of the jobs that have to be done for, at golf tournaments. Um, we um, kept the books, the treasurer wrote the checks at the end of the, at the, at the, end of the tournament. We, uh, I was always on the tournament committee, which was responsible for setting up the golf course courses and making the rulings. I'd, I'd go into a, a town, uh, you know, to get it out that Tuesday morning and go out and pound out of bounds stakes and paint. And we didn't paint, they didn't have any of this nice white paint, you know, as you go along and with spray paint inside the edges of the water hazards. So I gave you at times a, a, a little bucket of lime. And then you could go down and you could line the edge of the hazards. Oh my gosh. It was real no work. And then I'd write the rule sheet every week for the, for the tournament. And uh, I, it didn't seem like a burden to me. I kind of enjoyed doing that. And uh, I saw the course very well when I was out there lining all those guys. I could really pound stakes well out there. <laughs> but anyway, because I, I, I enjoyed it and I knew it was important, it, it wasn't a burden. You remain competitive longer than most golfers. Your wonderful health and your ability to continue to golf as an octogenarian are inspiring. Do you have any diet or exercise tips to share? <laughs> no, I, no, I don't, to tell you the truth. Uh, we, you know, we didn't even think about working out when I was, when I was coming up during the LPG. That's a fairly recent phenomenon. Uh, they have a fitness man now, of course, and I'll play to work out, but we never thought of doing that. And uh, I still, well, I know, I still do a little bit, but there's, uh, uh, Alice Miller, uh, Alice Miller is a, the person who uh, played, played on the LPGA Tour for, uh, and went, won tournaments and was uh, really uh, won our tournament one year, won the Dinosaur World Achievements Player of the Year one year and all, and a uh, fine player. And uh, she took my place at the, when, I was getting, when I was retiring. And, uh, and then, then she stayed up here in Lump, and now she's a teaching pro at, uh, at DuPont Country Club. Uh, and a very good one, an excellent teacher. But she's a, she is a, a teaching, a certified teacher of the, this uh, uh, Timeless uh, TPI. Yeah, uh, yeah, TPI. You know, Timeless Performance uh, Institute, I think they call it. And she's certified. And so she's been starting me on a program of exercise. And uh, it's kind of hard. <laughs> but I've been doing it. A little bit, and I can tell the difference. But that's that's the first time I've actually done it. Really worked out. But in nutrition, I've always been a pretty good eater. Uh, you know, I traveled. Uh, I ate out, I guess, every day for 30 years or whatever. <laughs> and, and, you know, you'd go in the restaurants and you'd have steak and baked potato and salad. That was kind of the norm. And I always loved going to Texas and Florida because they had these uh, great cafeterias, and I could get all my Fried okra, turnip greens, <laughs> uh, but I've always liked fruits and vegetables and stuff. So, but I never really concentrated on it. I was certain not a fanatic about it. What's in your bag now? Are you still playing Wilson clubs? Um, no, I have a, some TaylorMade uh, irons and some something else, something else, nothing. But I, I'm going to get some new. I think they're too heavy now. Finally, I have to get lighter clubs, and uh, I think I'm, I'm going to get a new set of pink clubs. So. They're all good clubs. Clubs are amazing, my gosh. Do you have any favorite club that's going to stay in your bag, a go-to club? No, I never uh, got attached to any one club. 
I will say it's funny. Uh, I never thought that the clubs made a difference much. I always thought it was the person who sung the clubs. <laughs> <laughs> There's my problem. <laughs> so, but Wilson used to just send me a set of clubs in the winter time, when I was at home in the winter, and uh, I'd take them out, take them out, and play, play with them the next year. Uh, I never, they asked, never asked me. Are your clubs all right? Would you like to test them? You, you know, no, they just sent me a club and I went out and played with them. So I've never been uh, too, too picky about what golf clubs are. I think if I, if I swing well, I can use any club. How much do you think technology has altered the game? And, and do you well, think it's a good thing? Yeah, well, it, it's tremendously, of course, they've altered it. Uh, good Lord, the, the balls farther. The, the USGA finally got around to saying they had, can't, the, club, the ball at which it comes off the club head can't, can only be at some, can't be more than some speed. Uh, but the manufacturers have, have really, really gone, gone overboard about adding technologically, uh, technologically enhan technological enhancements to clubs. You can now you can change the loft of clubs, you can change the weight of clubs, um, the ball, you know, they, they, they check the launch launch angle for the players, and they, uh, the ball rotates at certain speed. I, it's just amazing what they've done with golf clubs. And it has made a huge difference. It's uh, made a lot of courses obsolete for the, for the new pros, uh, which is kind of unfortunate. Uh, but uh, they, they, you know, the club has, of course has to be at least 75,000 yards long, uh, 7,500 yards long <laughs> now. So, uh, well, that are, are just a pitch and put up for them. So, uh, is, it, is it good or bad? I don't know. I, it had, I don't know that it's helped ordinary golfers much. Uh, I guess it has, but I, got, but I read something. You were just about the same as they we were 10 years ago, so. But they hit it further into the woods. They hit it further into the woods. <laughs> yeah, that's a good point. So, it, I, they, but it, it, if I think, if anybody thinks it's bad, it's never going back. They're never going to go back to the old equipment. I think that maybe they can stop it where it is. And, uh, but it's a remarkable, when I watch those men on TV, I can't believe how far they hit it and how, how, high, they, how high they hit it over something. They do anything with it. It's just absolutely amazing how good they are. And golf is a, such a tough game. It's just really a tough game. But what did I tell you? Uh, there, there's some. There's some. I read recently um, in an interview that you did, you said you're still in search of the perfect swing. I've seen you swing, it looks pretty darn good. What am I missing? <laughs> well, that's far from perfect, I gotta say that. I, I think, doesn't everybody search for the perfect swing? Or don't you all go out and say, well, you don't, you know? Except uh, uh, Yeah, you might try to fix I'll say that. And, and, uh, no, I have not found a potential question. I have not found a perfect swing, but I think I know more about the golf swing now than I ever did. And whether I can do what I want to do, it's a, it's a little, little bit hard. It's a little bit harder. But I watch the, those men. I watch Golf Channel all the time. I, I'm sure you, you all watch it a lot. I study those things, and they all try to do pretty much the same thing these days. They all swing a line. Funny, every, almost every man out there has a good golf swing, and they do look alike. In, in the old days, nobody looked like <laughs> Sam Snead. looked totally different from Ben Hogan. He looked totally different from Byron Nelson. Totally different from you know, okay. but now they all look alike. I mean, they all look like perfect swings. But no, I have not found it, but I'm still looking for it. <laughs> <laughs> Do you think there's any hope that the LPGA will ever return to the DuPont Country Club? Probably not. Uh, they're sort of priced out of our market now. It's cost a lot of money to put on a golf tournament. Uh, probably five or six million dollars, something like that. And, and the, we gave a lot of money to charity in the McDonald's terminal because uh, McDonald's, we had the support of the McDonald's uh, Corporation. And McDonald's, the, the terminal was owned by a 50 not profit organization uh, locally. And uh, they went to McDonald's, and it was a, a, a made up of McDonald's uh, owner operators and suppliers. And they went to McDonald's and got their support an agreement to ask uh, their suppliers to help sponsor the tournament. And that's why we took in so much money. If, uh, you know, if, if the purchasing guy at McDonald's went to J.R. Simplot, who supplied all the potatoes 
from McDonald's in the country, what they are going to say. How much do you want? Basically, is what you said. And so they, a lot of money came into our tournament, and we were able to give, I think, $57 million away wow. over the life of the tournament. So it was just, just fantastic. Yeah. But anyway, not many, there are not many situations like that. Uh, and, and locally, but I don't think there are enough big companies around now who can uh, support a tournament like that. Uh, uh, which is unfortunate. DuPont Country Club was the best place in the world to have a tournament. It was, uh, the volunteers were absolutely spectacular. I mean, I came there and I couldn't believe how good they were. And I thought, boy, I think DuPont must train their people really well. <laughs> because they were, they were off to responsibility for their committees. And it was very, very impressive. And uh, the golf course was a great spectator course. <laughs> you all probably walked it, and, but it's, Things fairly close, and it's, they loved it, and uh, and we did because we enjoyed putting it on. It, and the, the fans were going you know, to a lot of people, and, but I don't think it'll come back because of economic conditions. We are going to get another tournament in the region. The um, Crown International Crown oh, Competitions yeah, yeah. come in the Caves Valley. What do you think of that? That's right. Going? That's a, have you all heard about that? The yeah. International. It's going to be Caves Valley. That's what an hour's drive from here or something. But anyway, we all should go and look at it. It's a, it, it's a, it's a good format, and it, it's so much fun to watch match play. And the format is they select eight countries, uh, and they go by the, uh, the Rolex, the Rolex, uh, uh, Rolex, not the money list, the well, the standings. But, yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, and then the eight countries who have the highest number of points in the uh, Rolex standings then get qualify for, to, for the tournament and then they get to bring four players uh, and from the Rolex uh, uh, I anyway, from the Rolex standings. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's great and then they come and they play a match three rounds of uh, four ball play and then the one round of single, the three round of like two rounds of, and then one round of singles play. And at the end of the day, whoever has won the most points then wins the cup. Uh, the only weakness of it that I can see is there are some good players who will not qualify for that. For instance, Suzanne Patterson, who at that time could be the number one player in the world, won't be able to play because uh, Norway does not have enough good players mm -hmm. on the on the Rolex list to qualify for that. Mm -hmm. uh, there's a couple of good players in Germany. Germany won't qualify. They, the countries that qualify are the U.S. and uh, Sweden and Spain and Australia and then South Korea, Japan, Thailand, and the LPGA says Chinese Taipei. The players from there say Thailand. <laughs> but those are the eight countries that qualify. And they'll bring four players, and so I don't think that I even will have heard of some of the players that come from the Asian countries. But uh, Katrina Matthew from Scotland, only, no, no uh, country in <coughs> Great Britain had qualified for it. And only Spain and Sweden uh, are the only countries that, from Europe, that are, which is kind of strange. But I think that's a kind of a, a downer that you won't get to see some of the top players in the world. But it's fun to watch the, 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 that format, I think, match play. I think I'll probably go over and watch. Uh, Where is it and when is it? It's in the Caves Valley over in Baltimore. A really fine golf course. Yeah, it's a uh, club over there. Maybe like third week of July, something Yeah, like middle of July. Right on July 12th or 15th, something like that. Uh, the fun part would be at the end of the uh, tournament, if there's a tie and um, points, uh, then there's a sudden death playoff to see who wins. Uh, now, say the U.S. and South Korea tied points, then each uh, each uh, country would have put turned in an envelope with a player's name in there, and uh, so they'd open the envelope, and whoever the, that team had uh, picked to to go into the sudden death playoff would go out and play off in sudden death to see who won the international crown. Now, you think that's not pressure? That would be pressure. <laughs> Yeah. So anyway, that would be fun to watch, though. So. So we'll see how that turns out. If you could change one thing about the LPGA, what would it be? The LPGA is uh, in pretty good shape now. Uh, the new commissioner apparently is doing a good job. 
the, the one thing I'd like to see them do, I don't know if they can, uh, it's not something they do badly or do wrong, but I think we don't have enough domestic, US, American domestic tournaments. Uh, it's so easy to, well, it's easier to get now for him to get tournaments in Asia, for instance, and not because I guess that's the more money than we do now. Well, but it's also easy to schedule limited field events like this, like this cup, the International Crown. Uh, Lorena Ochoa's tournament, for instance, in Mexico is 32 players. And a couple of tournaments at the end of the year, there are 30 players, there are 32 players in one, 50 in another, so forth. But what that does, it, it makes the money list in the top of the rankings uh, uh, self-perpetuating, sort of. You see, if you uh, if you're in the top 50 and you get to play on all the tournaments for the top 50, the person that's uh, you know, 50, 51st does not have as a, a fair opportunity to, to move up and or to get that or for the young players to get the experience that they could be getting if they were more uh, full field tournaments. But I, I, that was a it happened uh, when <coughs> there's the, the downturn in the economy and for various reasons. So I'd like to see that that change happened, whether or not they, and I hope they can bring that about. Good point. Last but not least, do you have any, any advice for us, the Delaware Women's Golf Association, <laughs> uh, in our mission to grow women's golf in the state and the surrounding areas? Women's golf? Uh, well, uh, that, uh, <coughs> let me see, let me see. Uh, I'd say junior, good junior golf clubs uh, help bring that about. Uh, and I, I don't want to commend drama for the work that the first tee does. They really, they really encourage juniors to play golf, and uh, they get them involved, and that helps the game. That helps them, helps the game. Uh, the good junior programs for girls that I've seen, uh, San Diego, for instance, and uh, Tulsa, Oklahoma, they had a woman in each one of those places who was passionate about growing, uh, starting girls playing golf. At an early age, and they would they would organize the the, uh, the group and and schedule tournaments and form and go around uh, and get clubs to agree to, to have to put on competitions, and I, and uh, then they grow up to they get started in golf, and I think they, a lot of times that that they continue to do that. Golf uh, the kids like uh, playing. I think in playing in competitions. I think competition, having competitions for juniors is the secret of growing a, uh, an organization of juniors. I don't know if that's the here or not. You don't have any junior girl players, do you? And not a lot, players. but uh, we do run a junior amateur, and um, I think that's it's in line with our mission and yeah. to, to work harder at that. So good, good. good. But, uh, they have to, but these three other players have to little events almost every week in the summer that they can go to. And, but anyway. And uh, to get women to play, it, well, it takes so much time, golf does. A lot of women work now, so it's not as easy as for them as it used to be, I think. Uh, there's a, besides the first tee, which does a wonderful job all over the country, there's a, also an LPGA, USGA girls golf program. And uh, they've, uh, last I heard, they've reached 60,000 girls or something over the last 10 years. But if you're interested in uh, getting more information about organizing programs, uh, you could, could, could to call the LPGA or the USGA and uh, get more information about that. But golf is such a wonderful game, and it's a shame more people don't play, more women don't play, because it's a, I think it's a great thing ever to ever have in the world, the game of golf. I, <laughs> I, and I've always said, I think golf may be the one thing that can save the world. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, thank you very much. Oh, thank you all.